check. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, where's the little uh, clicker? There it is. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I'm from the MIT Media Lab. Um, prior to coming here, I was a hardware engineer at uh, Magic Leap and where we helped build the ML1 headset. And uh, currently at the lab, I'm working at new sort of interface uh, technologies and sort of holographic sort of uh, uh, hardware that hope to push AR, VR a little bit further. Um, so today's talk, I wanted to sort of uh, talk about sort of the latest in AR, as you might have seen a little bit in the previous presentation. Uh, there's still a lot that needs to be done in this space, but uh, hopefully, you know, people are pushing this for forward uh, every day. And uh, what I wanted to do first, kind of take you guys through these different platforms of uh, where AR is at the moment. Um, you know, light fields, holograms are all like ways to kind of create these immersive experiences, but sort of it depends on what you're looking for as a, whether you're a consumer or uh, in the industry. Um, and so what I want to do right now, I'll kind of just talk, talk through different of these platforms, sort of like, you know, we saw earlier phone, tablet based AR displays. There's wearable AR displays and wearable mixed reality displays. And also, you know, ultimately, we, we want to have experience we, where we don't need to have to wear anything, right? So that's more of these non-wearable experiences. And so um, I'm sort of in the space looking at all different technologies and seeing how we can kind of push each one forward and, and examine them from a, from a technology perspective. Um, so I want this to be more informative and uh, interesting for you guys and have a bunch of gifts in, in this presentation to kind of engage in that way. Um, so if we start with sort of phone tablet AR, right? So um, you might have seen earlier, you have Pokemon Go, Snapchat. These are kind of these starting experiences that help enable these sort of initial AR platforms. Um, you know, with just a phone and a camera, you can add a shadow under the, the object and make it look pretty immersive. But, you know, um, and Apple is developing their little AR kit platform um, to develop sort of these gaming experiences on their iPad. But as you notice, like, you know, you're still restricted to like the tablet, the form factor of the phone. <laughs> And there's really not much you could do. But at the same time, there's experiences like this where you can just take your phone out and measure like the, the frame uh, width or height of your you know, portrait and kind of build your own sort of like uh, frame for that. And so there's a lot of applications that are useful for these mobile AR platforms. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, again, you're restricted by phone or tablet and it's not really immersive. And you might have noticed nowadays you're coming to these AR headsets, uh, which is wearable displays, um, you know, whether they have a field of view, you know, efficiency. There's a lot of different factors that are involved in terms of building these displays. Uh, for example, like this is a, an example of how much of what AR uh, relies on, you know, Google Glass has like a little prism that reflects onto you. Uh, Lumis Vision is like a waveguide based display. Um, HoloLens is using something like this, like a, um, another waveguide type of system that's uh, expanding your pupil to, so you can see your uh, um, virtual image through this transparent screen. Um, and so these are sort of standard ways to do AR. Um, again, there's a lot of things that are so involved, like field of view, efficiency, uh, eye box size, um, that are all, all part of this uh, experience. And these are all sort of like important parts and kind of pushing it further. Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's good. Okay, it's good. Um, it's a bit further. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is this better? Okay, great. Um, so uh, the first one you guys have already seen Google Glass, right? It's it's a monocular display and it's uh, just a prism optics, full color, and uh, it, it's a really stylish kind of device. But again, there's some restrictions involved with it, right? So let's say you're wearing this display on the road, on the bike, and you want to sort of experience something, you have an issue here, right? So this is kind of dangerous when you're looking on the road and you're focusing at a different distance for the display, right? So the, the image plane is located really close to the eye, and that kind of affects sort of the experience of the user. So ultimately, you want sort of an immersive experience where the, the images are located a bit further away, or some kind of a um, you know, dynamic sort of focal uh, array that sort of allows you to have like uh, focal abilities to kind of look at different distances. Um, so you want to be able to wear these glasses anywhere you go. And so um, Google Glass attempted to do this, but it's still like, you know, we're still kind of working on towards a more of immersive experience. Um, Loomis, you might have seen this at uh, Las Vegas and CES. Uh, they're uh, building these optical engines that allow for um, sort of immersive experiences, and they're using like these reflective waveguides in about 40 degrees field of view. Um, in this case, their, their image plane is at infinity, so basically you're allowed to, you can see content further away, and you're, it's not much, it's not really distracting to the user. Um, and so they've, you know, partnered with Daiquiri and Aether to kind of develop these sort of uh, um, uh, 
immersive uh, AR platforms. And this is an example of what you see through uh, their display, their waveguide is, you know, uh, imagine like a floating dragon through this transparent display. This is built on like waveguide optics and this is still not uh, perfect, right? So um, there's a lot of leakage light. You'll see if you look closer, um, there's some double reflection happening. These are all part inherent uh, kind of defects in the system and something that people are actively pushing towards in, in improving the quality of these waveguide displays. Um, but yet, you know, this, you can see this experience is way more immersive than what you saw earlier. Um, you know, but again, there's still constraints, right, with these AR displays. Uh, it adds layer of content in the real world with no sort of real understanding of the environment. Uh, you know, it's just a display on your face. And they usually employ these single focal planes, so you're focusing on some distance, uh, like Google Glass close to your eye, and for Loomis, like a little bit further away. And so there's not much depth of field kind of uh, happening in these systems. Um, so now I kind of enter this whole mixed reality sort of experiences, right? So you have like HoloLens, and you have Magic Leap, and all these different folks. Um, you know, with HoloLens, you know, with, they basically incorporated this, this Connect platform with their sort of waveguide technology, and that sort of enables sort of this immersive experience that it feels a bit more real than others. Um, you know, it's full color, it's a bit expensive, and it's, you know, they're working on their later version, but, you know, we still have, like, it's, it's a, definitely an experience that's better than what you had before. Um, this is an example of what you see through the HoloLens, right? So in the first, uh, in the t uh, left uh, GIF, you sort of notice this guy wearing the HoloLens in, in Central Park, and he's playing uh, uh, this Mario game, right? And so basically the, the whole, the park becomes like this environment for him to play this game, and it feels like he's actually in, in the game itself. In the top right, you have um, sort of this person like seeing a hologram of himself um, on his coffee table, basically recorded through this Connect platform. And in the bottom right, you see someone playing a video game through this, uh, on their, in their living room through the HoloLens headset. So you start getting into this realm of more ex immersive experiences and it enables a much uh, more sort of a fluid type of uh, um, kind of way to sort of see AR. And, um, you know, and then you have Magic Leap, right? So, you know, trying to employ this whole digital light field technology and then a full color environment mapping and, you know, having some <coughs> machine learning involved for visual perception. Um, you know, basically a light field is essentially a, a way to kind of create sort of depth, right? So you allow some objects to appear focused in some distance and then other objects to appear blurry in other distances, right? So um, with that, you know, with their platform, you kind of notice that this is like sort of public to people is, you know, in their, in their platform, you sort of see like these experiences that look way more realistic than what you noticed before. And uh, like, for example, the top left, you have R2D2 kind of displaying like a hologram of, uh, you know, this, this uh, area onto the coffee table, and then bottom left you notice uh, the solar system sort of in place in, in your living room, and um, you know, and, and you have a little robot hiding behind your table, right? So there's all these different parts to it, like you know, how do you do occlusion? How do you sort of recreate this image? How do you sort of uh, fo uh, enable the user to focus at different distances and still see the object almost like it's real in front of you? Um, you know, but there's still constraints again, right? Mixed reality is it's it's happening right now, and uh, it's it's still like this part of AR ecosystem. But you know, field of view is still important. Light efficiency is very important. You know, you know, if you're in the sunlight, you know, uh, if you tried wearing your Hololens or something in the sunlight, it's you start having some issues with terms of like the brightness of the of the image. That's why you have this kind of shield in front of the Hololens. Um, you know, brightness is also another issue, and you know, manufacturing, right? So a lot of times. You know, when you're making these photonics or you know other technologies that are involved, it, it, the cost of manufacturing is very expensive. Um, but these are areas that you know people are actively working on, and um, we see sort of like how that's going. Um, and then going on to sort of non-wearable experiences, right? So uh, this is very interesting, I think, to me because ultimately I don't really want to wear like a glasses at all. And uh, um, imagine if you can sort of see holograms in front of you. Um, we always want that Princess Leia hologram that, you know, just projects into space. Um, and so you might be familiar with the Tupac hologram, right, and, um, hologram, but it, in Coachella 2012, uh, basically it's just like a reflective mirror on the stage, and, and, and this guy just appears, you know, he's, he's dead, but he's like kind of comes back to life. And, uh, and this, this experience sort of like allows you to sort of see what a hologram could look like. And this is not really a hologram in any scientific sense, but it's more of a, um, a, a magic trick, right? But it kind of shows you what, it, what this would look like in the future. Um, 
And this is something that just came out recently. Uh, Leap Motion actually uh, announced something called Project North Star. And what's really cool about this is they're in integrating their gesture technology and their uh, sensors with sort of like this AR platform to enable sort of this interactive experience using uh, gesture-based input and uh, sort of displays. Um, on the left, you see this uh, person sort of holding this virtual cube and essentially interacting with it. Um, and it's, the tracking is very, very great. And you're basically almost like you're holding this object in free space. In the top right and the bottom right, you notice like a Iron Man type of interface, right? You're, you have a, your hand, you pull out this interface, you can change some options. And this is something where I, I definitely see this happening in the near future. And I think as AR gets more and more immersive, you can essentially like, use the world as your, as your desktop, and, and that becomes your computing platform. Um, recently also in Nature publication, one of our colleagues uh, who's now a professor at uh, BYU uh, just uh, was on Nature for um, sort of creating this photophoretic uh, trap volumetric display. Essentially, this is a freeform display, uh, no sort of wearable optics required. Essentially, you're just using a laser to basically illuminate these particles in air, and you're essentially printing holograms, right? And this is something that just came out a few months ago, and uh, you should definitely look it up. Essentially, they have a, a laser that, that colors a particle, and then a, another laser that controls the movement. And you can, uh, as the light scatters in our directions, you can essentially print these sort of uh, little holograms that are above, like, you know, about that size. And the goal is, you know, how do you make it larger? How do you make it more um, uh, immersive? And so this is happening at, at the, uh, you know, as we speak. Um, so, you know, what's kind of next, right? I mean, I, I kind of give a little overview of sort of these different technologies, and there's so many different options to go. Um, you know, waveguides are a really in interesting way to kind of create uh, sort of these effects. Uh, at, at the Media Lab, we're actually working on sort of new structures and uh, um, waveguide holograms that are allowing you to sort of see 3D content in a, in a more immersive way with, you know, all the different, like, depth cues and provided. Um, and also, you know, there, there's a lot of work going on in metamaterials at the moment where, you know, you can essentially create like a custom lens that has a different focal length, um, essentially with, by, with, with metamaterials. And, um, but ideally, you know, you want to have, to create these immersive experiences, having some kind of like a, a dynamic system that sort of can track your eye or like can uh, display information at different depths is very important to these experiences. And how do you do that in a very uh, computationally like in inexpensive way, right? Um, another thing is sort of like, uh, there's these things called spatial light modulators, which essentially control the phase properties of light. Now you can use those to create like actual holograms. That hologram is essentially like a, um, you know, interference pattern or diffraction pattern that sort of uh, contains the phase properties of an image. And you can sort of reconstruct that and essentially recreate the entire waveform of, of the light. So, you know, that's, in a hologram perspective, that's what a hologram is. It's not like the, the, the Tupac hologram you saw earlier. And so people are looking at these new spatial modular technologies um, to essentially create these sort of uh, essential wavefronts, uh, recreate these wavefronts. Um, and I think computer vision becomes a really important role in this, right? Because you're having to sense the environment and how do you sort of create sensors that do sensing and display at the same time. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, re uh, eye tracking and manufacturing is very important. So. I, I sort of wanted to carry you through these different like platforms and see like where we're going at the moment. And there's still a lot that needs to be done, but uh, I hope that kind of like gives a little survey of this field and helps you better understand what AR is and like what where the technology is at at the moment. Well, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Okay, we have some time for questions for Vic. Do we have any questions today? Last major lead uh, for your last major lead uh, demo, uh, wh uh, wh where you see through that because that your, your title is non wearable display, right? But uh, the major lead things look like there's still another display. Uh, this one? Just, no, the previous one. Oh, yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, oh, this yeah. one. This one. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's correct. You're correct. Um, this, this does require like a, an optic in front. Uh, it's definitely some wearable is involved. Um, yes, that is correct. Uh, but I think what I wanted to highlight was essentially like the, the, the robustness of this sort of method is they're, they're combining their, their tracking system with this optics. And I think that allows for a kind of different immersive experience. Any more questions for Vic? Optics or battery life, what are you guys focusing or where do you think you should focus more on? 
I would say battery life, actually. I'm actually pretty impressed with the optics at the moment. Um, I think, to be honest, the battery life is gonna be the most important thing. Um, I was discussing this with a friend of mine uh, yesterday, actually. I mean, when you're wearing a headset, like, if you wanted to wear, like, weigh light enough, like, your pair of glasses, then how do you incorporate enough battery life to last the entire day? And I think that's, to be honest, like, a really big part of it. And, I mean, the optical engine consumes a lot of the battery, right? Like, if you're using, like, you know, a waveguide or something, your projection system um, does require, like, that amount of battery. But I think, overall, the, the battery life is going to play the most important role. But, I mean, like, I think, I don't know if it's how Snapchat works with their glasses, but I think they charge in their case or something. And, um, you know, you could always carry your case around, but, I mean, I don't know if I really want to do that all the time. <laughs> do you think the current generation of 4K SLMs will be sufficient for full-phase holograms, or do you think we need to wait for 8K before they'll be the sufficient resolution to compete with the likes of these? Oh, um, I don't have a good answer to that question. I think 4K at the moment is currently what we're using for like a lot of the holographic stuff. But I mean, even with the current existing like spatial light modulators in market, um, a lot of the issue is more like the space bandwidth uh, because you know you need to display um, and, and the amount of the computation like you're you're basically transmitting like gigapixels per second for transmitting creating these phase holograms. So when you're computing that, like how do you compete that in real time? I think that's more of an issue than like maybe the pixel pixel size, like the, the pixel density of like the actual SLM. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hey, Vic, great talk. Um, in terms of holograms, what do you think needs to happen for real collaboration to go on? A lot of times you talk about it as one person working with one hologram, and I know you worked with Metcalf and talked about the network effect. I think the network effect is going to be big here, and what are some of the technical challenges for that? Yeah, actually, we had some folks from, uh, I think, was it Verizon that, that spoke with uh, our group earlier? And I think, you know, one of the things is, you know, 5G with this, with this new 5G network. And if going further, I think the network latency is going to become really, like, important because you're not just transmitting, like, just 2D signals, but something raw 3D content. And I think uh, right now we're still, to, we're still having, like, figured out the display itself yet, um, like the ideal holographic display, it's still, it's still like, it, we, don't, we don't know what it looks like at the moment. Um, as you saw like in, in the slide here, um, at the top right, we're still working on like this kind of stuff, but um, the network side of it also is the other half, is like how do you try to transmit the information, and that's something I don't really have a good answer to, but I, I, that's gonna be a, a pretty tough problem to crack. Time for one more question. You mentioned that wearables have issues with um, bright lights. Is anyone doing outside work well? Um, I, I would say yes. I just don't know, like, in terms of, uh, so if you saw, um, kind of going back to uh, this one here, right? This is sort of in, not outside, but in bright light settings. Um, this is kind of like what you kind of see what, if, you, if you kind of, Take, if you take this out to a bright light setting outside, it gets even worse. You get a lot of leakage and you get a lot of like reflections and um, people are experimenting a different kind of optical coatings and different ways to kind of reduce that reflection. But um, what happens with the waveguide, for example, is the sunlight essentially diffracts through your glass and then it reflects backwards and it causes a lot of like diffraction that you don't want in your waveguide. And, and essentially you have to like play around with that and see how you can cancel that out. And that's a, that's a problem that's, uh, you know, people are, maybe, I think it'll, it'll be figured out, but it's still kind of uh, being worked out at the moment. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.